Lord Shiloh. Amen. You should be praying, not sleeping. <laughs> Good to be in the house of the Lord. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Praise God. Aren't we excited on this resurrection morning? Be in the house of the Lord today. Amen. We got a few minutes before we start our service. Let's shake each other's hand and welcome each other into the house of the Lord. Take some time to love on somebody. Let them know that you're happy to see them in the house of the Lord. In Jesus' name, we're going to have church today.
Good morning, Shiloh Tabernacle. Let somebody say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We're so excited and blessed to be here on Resurrection Sunday, where we celebrate the death, burial, and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the wonderful miracle that brought us salvation into our day and to our lives today. God has been so good to us. We welcome each and every one of you who are here in the house of the Lord and those who are joining us online. We greet you in the wonderful name of Jesus. We open our service this morning by reading in Matthew chapter 28 and verse 6. The word of the Lord says, he is not here for he is risen. As he said, come see the place where the Lord lay. We have so much to be thankful for and to celebrate and to be excited about today. So I invite you to remain standing as we read in Psalm 95, verse 1 and 2. The word of the Lord instructs us, O come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. Let us exalt his wonderful name and worship him together with the music team at this time.
why seek ye the living among the dead? saying the son of man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and a third day rise again and, word. and returned from the separate culture and told all these things unto the eleven and to all the rest And their words seemed to them as idle tales, and they believed them not. And behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem, about three score furlongs. All together, and it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. Thank you, Jesus. Thank the Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. Blessed be your name, O God. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. Praise you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Sister Jackson. Oh, praise, praise the Lord. Lord. Oh, praise the Lord. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thanks, Jesus. Wonderful God. Wonderful praise God. God. So good to be in the house of God yes, this morning. Is. Praise God. Praise Amen. God. As we continue to worship and praise our God, let us take of our tithes and our offering at this time. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. In 2 Corinthians 9, 7, it says, Every man, according as he purposes in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. Praise God.
Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Well, you may be seated. We have a video presentation this morning. It had been three long days. The echoes of the cross still filled the air. There was a darkness that was palpable, a sense of dread that was all-consuming. Fear permeated the landscape, powered by an inconceivable loss. Hope was dead. But in the distance was a sound, the sound of earth moving, of foundations rattling, the sound of God taking back the world he loved. Darkness had been flooded with light. Fear had been overtaken by hope. Death had been swallowed in victory. In that moment, sin lost its power. The grave lost its sting and evil was left broken in defeat. He is victorious. He is triumphant. He is risen. Jesus is alive. He is alive this morning. Somebody jump to your feet and shout, he's risen. Come on, somebody, just celebrate that he's risen. He's risen from the grave. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen. Oh, my, my, my. Can you imagine that day, church, when he rose from the grave? Oh, powers in his hands. The grave could not hold him down. My God, my God, we thank the Lord. The book of Revelations, chapter 1 and verse 18 says, I am he that liveth and was dead and behold I am alive forevermore amen and have the keys of hell and of death the reason why this scripture is so powerful is because it's written in the book of revelations this is God talking about what he did at Calvary he said I am he <laughs> that liveth and was dead now hang on a minute how could God who's eternal die is because he became flesh. Come on now, somebody. And behold, I am alive forevermore. And I've got the keys. Come on, somebody say, he's got the keys. He's got the keys to unlock all bondage. The Bible says of hell and of death. Someone just shout hallelujah. We are blessed this morning on this Resurrection Sunday to celebrate our risen Savior. God bless you, church. You may be seated. Amen. My heart is glad to be back in Athabasca. We are in the land of the living. We are in the land of blessings. Amen. I don't mind telling you I enjoy going here and going there, but there's just something about coming home. Oh, yes, yeah. something about coming home. I don't know what I'm talking about. Amen. And I just hear the songs of Zion, and my heart is filled and enriched. We are so blessed on this week. God granted us traveling mercies to Calgary and traveling mercies home from Calgary. Amen. And we have some tremendous Sunday school, excuse me, reports from the children's ministry department and the youth department. And I want to let everybody know that the Lord visited us in such a wondrous way. We have, we had 80 children in peak attendance at the Save Our Children Holy Ghost Rally. Can someone shout hallelujah? And it gets better. We had 33 children filled with the Holy Ghost, 19 first time, 
and 14 refills. Somebody ought to jump to your feet and say, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. And you may ask, well, how do you know they got filled with the Holy Ghost? Because they spake with tongues as the Spirit of God came upon them. Amen. Brother O'Donnell came up to me as we were wiping all our tears away and blowing our nose. He said, Pastor, I've never felt such a powerful altar call service amongst children. It felt like we were an adult service. On the last day, we were singing a song of victory, and all the parents were standing at the door waiting for their kids, and I said, you're just going to have to wait because we're having church in here. <laughs> Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. And we're so excited that Brother Trevor was filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen. Sister Ruth was refilled with the Holy Ghost. Sister Faith, Brother Ryder, Brother Ty. I was refilled with the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Amen. I was there, and I was refilled. <laughs> you may be seated. <laughs> Praise. This is not an amazing church. Now, I say this carefully, but as far as my recollection, this is a record-breaking Save Our Children Holy Ghost Rally for our district. Can we thank God for that? And I'll tell you what, church. It is no doing of our own. We just blew up the balloons, <laughs> hung up the streamers, and God filled the kids with the Holy Ghost. Look at the difference of power. <laughs> Amen. All I have in me is hot air, but the power of God comes in and fills those kids. I can't do it, but God can. We were so blessed. We had with us brother and sister Cannon from headquarters. Amen. The Sunday School Directors representing the children's ministries around the world. We had the cream of the cream with us. And we had evangelist Brother Nathan Roberts with us. And wasn't he awesome, kids? Wow, wasn't that awesome? We got some pictures here we want to share with you, just some of the setup. Amen. Isn't that beautiful? God blessed us in such a wonderful way. And also, we, are, we want to say thank you, Jesus, our young men. This was a record-breaking year for them. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost, refilled with the Holy Ghost. The power of God was calling them. And this year, they drove themselves to youth conference. <laughs> Amen. And they just did awesome. I'm telling you, they were such a support to us. And I want to thank you, young men, for your service and for helping. Praise the Lord. And I didn't have to worry about them. They, they had their own money, their own wheels. They knew how to tie their own ties and uh, take care of themselves. But not only that, they were in the front row. And they had their big King James Thompson chain Bibles in their hands. I tell you what, my heart was filled. My heart was filled. Amen. And I talked to them on the way. Well, actually, I'm going to have them talk to you. Young men, come and testify. Brother Gideon, come. Amen. Let's put our hands together for this young man. He is our next preacher of the gospel. Well, praise the Lord, saints. Oh, yeah, we had an amazing time this uh, youth conference. It really changed my perspective. It really filled me. It was, it was such an amazing service. And um, I feel so blessed that I got to be there with my pastor, be there with my, my brethren. We got to rejoice with God. I just thank God for keeping us safe on the road, like on the road, because I don't know if you guys know, but the, the roads in Calgary are kind of scary. <laughs> They're pretty, they're pretty rough, but yeah, he kept us safe on the way there, on our way back. I just thank him for that and for keeping us safe. Praise God. Uh, I thought I'll talk about the, uh, while we were there, they held two separate Sunday school, like, meetings, I guess you'd call them, where they brought in, what was his name? Brother Roberts and 
Brother Tan and the uh, one that helped lead the Sunday school ministry. And then they gave us lessons, and I decided to join in for the second one because sometimes I'm down there and working with the kids. And man, that was something. He really had a way of putting it in you. Like, he had a way of making sure you remember things and his methods were just so so good so you know i wrote them all down in my notes app and hopefully i can put them to use but i'm just thankful for that because you could tell he had 25 years of experience down there <laughs> he's keeping us engaged like we were the children <laughs> thank you guys praise god uh, uh, yeah so i'm really grateful to be able to go and service we went straight to the front got filled with the ghost and then once uh, we all had to sit down we kind of ran to the back to get there but one thing i want to take back is uh i think brother ben touched on it a little bit um like just the having a covering every day is so important when it comes to ministry and um i believe that's uh, something that we can help with this year Let's put our hands together for what God is doing. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that wonderful? Thank you, Jesus. Amen. And I want the church to know publicly, I thank you, young men. Amen. I don't have to worry about them at all. They're just texting me, saying, Pastor, we're here, we're there. We're doing this. And I was just didn't have to worry about them. And on the last night, we were out fellowshipping. And my wife and I, we were out fellowshipping with the ministers until 2 o'clock in the morning. And then they were out fellowshipping with the young people. And both of us are separately driving home. And I'm thinking, man, I probably should text these guys about getting ready to go in the morning. But maybe it's too late. Maybe they're sleeping. And I send them a text. And they were thinking the same thing. Pastor might be sleeping, but we'll send him a text anyhow. And there we were just having a good time on the streets of Calgary. <laughs> so needless to say, we're a little tired this morning, but our hearts are filled. Oh, our hearts are glad. Amen. Amen. And thank you to the O'Donnell family for their service, for their faithfulness dedication of love and to the Lovell family for your support and to all the saints that were praying for us. So to good so good to see Sister Lillian there and Sister Jobin there. Amen. And as I was walking uh, to the parking lot, I ran into my dear friend Eden and Cassandra and my heart just, oh, I just started crying. I just grabbed their necks and just told them how much I love them. And I can't wait to see them back in the house of the Lord. Oh, yes, God's working church. And on the last night, Brother Brown was preaching about loving your land. And he said, you go out and get a bucket of sand or uh, dirt. And my wife leaned over and she said, honey, we got those rocks from the Jackson Farm. I said, we're already ahead of the game. We've got the land. And we made a commitment to God. <laughs> oh, we love this land. As we were driving home, I could see the farm. I just wanted to run out there and just kiss the grass. I'm telling you. I said, God, I thank you. Thank you, Barathabasca. Thank you. And I don't mind telling you, he said, you need to look and see the influence, what your town does to your community. And if you look on the map of, of Alberta, and you go corner to corner, and you find that dot in the center, what town do you see? Athabasca. We're the heartbeat of this district. <laughs> they may not like it, but it's the truth. <laughs> I did it myself. I took a ruler and I went from the north to the south, from the west, and I drew it. And right in the middle, like a button, is Athabasca. Isn't that amazing? Church, 
We're, we're, we're in the center of the will of God. And I'm so glad for Athabasca. All our blessings flow. The goodness of God is here. And I praise the Lord. Amen. It was such an honor to be with our superintendent, Brother Patra, and his dear wife and the board members. Amen. For all their support to the Sunday School Ministry. And I give honor to our youth president, Brother Thomas Dehod, and to his cabinet. And for all of their hard work and dedication to make this happen. It's a lot of work, folks. A lot of money, a lot of effort. Amen. And so we want to say thank you. Amen. And thank you, God, for such a wonderful week. Amen. For the month of April, it's hard to believe that tomorrow is going to be April, but no April fools here. Amen. We don't have time for foolishness. Where is living for God with clarity and direction? Amen. And so we give some announcements with um, with uh, for coming up April. Now, I, I didn't mean you can't have fun on April Fool. So go ahead and, and have fun with your family. I'm just I'm just being spiritual here today. But go ahead and have fun. <laughs> Um, we have our Tuesday prayer guide that is that is available in the lobby. And uh, uh, because April is such a long month, we have five Tuesdays. So this Tuesday, I have created um, a prayer guide that I want everyone to have. And it's called How to Pray for Your Local Church. And there are several points there. And if I can ask Sister Lovell if she could hand those out to the saints today. If you want one, raise your hand and she'll come by and give you one. And that is what we're going to do. Now, church, I'm going to ask you to go to the next slide, brother. I want this Tuesday family prayer. Don't lose steam. Don't lose your momentum. Father Abraham knew how to build an altar. And we don't know. And I'm not trying to put fear in anybody's heart, but we don't know what tomorrow's going to hold. But if you have a family altar, I tell you what, you're going to weather the storms. Hello, somebody. If you have a family altar, if you know how to pray at home, you're going to make it. I know it's wonderful to come together and to pray, and we're going to do that. The Bible tells us to do that. But before we can come together, we have to already have a fire in our own home. Come on now. And we're going to build that altar. Amen. And we're going to continue, amen, to pray as families. Praise the Lord. Our children can get refilled with the Holy Ghost at home, right there in the living room. Yes, we can fight devils right in our own home, casting out unclean spirits in our own homes. Praise the Lord. And I was just encouraged, amen, on this week to remind everybody, stay faithful to your at-home prayer. And then the following Tuesday, do we have that there? We're going to all be here in person. Everybody say in person. So that's April the 9th. We're all going to be here. And I'm going to ask everybody to make a conscientious effort to do your very best to be in that prayer service. And we're going to start praying uh, for the month of April on children and youth. We're going to continue the momentum. Isn't it, isn't it neat how God does this? Amen. We didn't plan that, but God just put it all together. We're just coming out of youth conference, coming out of children's Holy Ghost rally, and we're going to pray for our children. The theme is titled, Next Starts Now. And we're not waiting for the devil and for the world to get a hold of our children. And then they circle back in their 17s, 18s, and they're so confused and lost. No, we're going to teach them now. Somebody say now. We're going to teach them now to fear the Lord with respect and reverence. Praise the Lord. Coming up on April the 14th, it's hard to believe, but we're going to have our second quarter Vision Sunday. Praise God. Someone look over and tell your neighbor, we made it through the winter. Amen. You survived. I'm thriving and I'm alive. Praise the Lord. So I invite you to come on down to that Sunday, April the 14th. And on that Vision Sunday, we're going to observe Holy Communion. And we're going to break bread and remember the shedding of his blood. And that's going to be a wonderful service. So I invite all to come down for quarter two. Refresh your vision 
a year of boldness. Praise the Lord. April the 26th, we are going to be uh, having family games night. Wasn't that awesome last month? We're going to do that again. Praise the Lord. A Friday, April the 26th at 7 p.m., we're going to have family games night. Amen. And so we encourage everyone to bring a snack, bring a drink, bring, bring something, bring yourself, bring a friend. Amen. And let's just have a good time of fellowship in the house of the Lord. Amen. Our new kids activity booklets are now available in our lobby and all of our children have access to that. Just a reminder that Pentecost Sunday is coming up. Amen. And that is the day that we celebrate the birth of the church. And we encourage all to come on May the 19th. And we invite you to wear white. Amen. Come on down and wear white. Praise the Lord. Let's all stand together as we celebrate the goodness of God today. The song says, I don't know what you've come to do, but I've come to praise the Lord. How about you? Amen. I don't know what you've come to do, but I've come to praise the Lord. I don't know what you've come to do, but I've come to praise the Lord. Protection. 
it was for our own good. So I want to encourage the saying, whatever you have been done, the landmark that had been there, it was marked for you to be saved. We are not fatherless. We are not fatherless. We are not orphans. No, we have a father. If we, yes, Pastor and Elder Neil may not be here, but our Heavenly Father is here with us, and we have been much are given, is much are required. So hold on, hold on, keep going on. Sometimes you may feel like alone, you feel like you don't need this, but hold on, hold on, you will worth it. Narrow is the road but it's leading to a life everlasting. And may God bless you all. Amen. Brother O'Donnell, come and testify. Praise the Lord. I want to thank God for what he's done over the youth conference weekend and uh, just a tremendous and wonderful outpouring of God's presence and his power. Um, you know, there, there's moments that happen in life that kind of stick with you and impact you for the rest of time to come and oftentimes you don't know what memories what moments you leave with other people and I was reminded of that when I was greeting individuals around youth conference and uh, one gentleman just cut right to my heart when he says you're like a dad to me I'll never forget when you did this for me I'll never forget when you did this in my life things I never remembered didn't mean as much to me as it did to that person but God reminded me of the moments that we leave in other people's lives and over the last few days there are moments that were added to my lives as I watched our children pray as I watched them pray through to the Holy Ghost I see our young men uh, worshiping God those are moments added to my life and I was also reminded of the things that we add to others so let us continue to be leaders and examples for those who are following after us Sister O'Donnell, come and leave your testimony. Amen. I'm using everybody today. Praise God. I worship him this morning. Well, youth conference was amazing, as everyone has said. Brother Brown did an incredible job, and it was amazing how he would preach two messages at once. I don't know if anyone else noticed that, but the, the adults were getting something, and the kids were getting something else, and he spoke to our hearts. And I want to thank God. At the beginning of the, the trip, we almost had to come home because my husband and I were ill. And we thought, how is he going to use this for good? We, we wanted to help so bad, and we wanted to be there, and we missed the first couple of days. But God showed us by the end that it did all work together in the connection with our children and what they told us about Youth Conference and how they interacted with God in a different way and it's hard to explain but God worked it together for good and we thank God for what he's doing in the children and in the adult service as well uh, God is just so good and uh, we give him all the glory praise the Lord at this time we dismiss all of our wonderful beautiful children to their respected classes praise God praise God so thankful for the revival in the Sunday School Department. Something the evangelist said that was so powerful to me is that people often will say, wow, what a great evangelist, and look at his success. And he said, no, that it's you as the teachers. You've been sowing the seed all these years. All these Sunday School classes, you've been sowing the seed and we're working together. Isn't that amazing, church? I said, wow, thank God for that wisdom. Because, you know, we as people, we're, we're, we're such Gentiles. We idolize people. How many understand that? That's why we, we're, we're in trouble without God. Gentiles, we idolize the sun. We idolize people. We idolize money. My, we're in trouble without the Lord. And if we're not careful, we can idolize people even in church. Amen. And the evangelist was he said, no, we're working together. And all you teachers brought these students from all across Alberta and Saskatchewan. Amen. You've been teaching them all these years. Be baptized. Repent of all your sins. Be filled with the Holy Ghost. I tell you, if you've never seen a child get the Holy Ghost, you know, change your life. Because you can't fake this. Children can't fake it like that. How many know what I'm talking about? 
But when the power of God comes upon them and those hot tears are squirting out of their eyes and, and you know, and some of them are a little bit afraid even. They don't know what's going on. And we say, it's okay. Just relax. It's going to, you're fine. Some of them that are a little bit older know what's going on and they're just speaking with tongues. It's just amazing. Book of Acts is still happening. Book of Acts is still happening. I want to encourage everybody, don't force your children, but let it happen naturally. Let it unfold. And I'm determined here at Shadow Tabernacle, our children are going to get the Holy Ghost because they love Jesus. Not because they're scared of him, but because they love Jesus. Amen. And I will set them on the right course. The reason I say that is because I, I got the Holy Ghost, but I was scared of Jesus for a long, long time. And I think it was around 18, 19, I started to realize I can't, can't continue on like this. I've got to fall in love with Jesus. And you can tell folks that are afraid of Jesus. They're, they're not very nice. But if you love Jesus, you're sweet. You're, you're gentle. You, hello? You care. There's a difference. So you may start off that way, terrified, <laughs> but you can't stay that way. Amen. And there's a transition. Some say transition. Praise the Lord. And like what my wife said, it was just such an honor. Amen. And I so thank God. Let's all stand together. We're going to read together the book of Romans, chapter 5. So good to have Hannah with us in the house of the Lord. Let's put our hands together for our dear friend and daughter of the groves it's a blessing that you're here so good to have campbell with us today so good to have luke and Bo. it's good to have russell with us in the house of the lord come on let's put our hands together to so all those that are watching online this morning on facebook and youtube to all god's children praise the lord romans chapter 5 and verse 8 you're going to help me preach this morning Amen. Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. Amen. The Bible says, But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. Today we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. Without him, we have no hope. Without him, we would not be here today. Bible says, while we were yet sinners, how many have thought, you know, when I figured it out, I'll live for God. How many thought of that? When I get it all together, I'll start going to church. That's not how it works. Your life is a mess. That's the perfect candidate to come to church. When things are in chaos, that's who he came to save. He didn't come to save the righteous. They had no need for him. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Would you help me pray for this portion of service in the name of Jesus? Father, you're here already. You're here in this place. And I thank you, Holy Ghost, for your divine help. Thank you for your strength, Lord. I pray that you touch my body, touch my voice. In the name of Jesus, I need your help today, God. I pray, Lord, that by one word that you administer to the congregation of thousands, Minister, I pray, Holy Ghost. Speak, Lord, and we will obey. In the name of Jesus. Oh, let's clap our hands thunderously and lift your voice and shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. God bless you. You may be seated. Amen. I've got them turning me up. Amen. So I don't lose my voice today. Praise God. The Bible lets us know that God became flesh, born of the virgin Mary. Amen. And the purpose that Jesus was on earth was to save the people from their sins. How many know that if it wasn't for Jesus, we wouldn't have a hope? We wouldn't have a prayer. None of us, including myself, wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Jesus. There are any testimonies out there that God delivered you from addiction. God did set you free from an immoral lifestyle. God took that bottle out of your hand. He took that drug 
He cleansed your blood. He purged your mind. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. And I praise him this morning for it. Thank you, Jesus. Matthew one twenty one says, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. The name Jesus means, it comes from the Hebrew root, meaning the Lord is salvation. He said, call his name Jesus. It means the Lord is our salvation. Salvation means to break the effects of sin. How many know that there are many bondage effects of sin? Chains that without a powerful name, those chains are not budget. Hello, somebody. Without Jesus, that addiction will not move. But he said, name that babe Jesus. The Lord is our salvation. And not only will he remove the effects of sin, it would, act, it would be like it never happened. When Jesus gets a hold of you and changes your life, he'll heal you. He'll rearrange you. He'll transform you. He'll make a difference in your life. How many know what I'm talking about? He's our salvation. Joseph and Mary did not come together to decide on what they're going to name this babe. This was a command from heaven. Mary had no say. Joseph had no say. You're going to name that baby Jesus. This is a command from heaven. You're going to name that babe. For that babe is going to grow up. And he's going to save the world from their sins. Oh, and the gospel of Luke records in Luke chapter 1 and verse 31 says, And behold, Thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shalt call his name Jesus. The Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Luke records that his name is Jesus. Praise the Lord. And in the Old Testament, the prophet Isaiah foretells of this in Isaiah 9 and 6. It says, For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. Uh, is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. I look at this scripture, and it says, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. What does it mean to have a government on your shoulder? It means that this babe is going to be the ruler of the world. <laughs> This ain't no ordinary baby. Amen. This is God in flesh. It is he that hath made the world. It is him in the beginning in the book of Genesis. And God said, I'm very thankful for that. Oh, hallelujah. God said. And he's responsible for the whole world. Nothing that's happening in this world today is catching God by surprise. No war. No famine. Come on, no heat wave, no fire, no flood, no accident is catching him off surprise. People are saying, well, why is he allowing all these things? Because he has created us with a will. You and I have the choice. When he made Adam and Eve, they have a choice. We're not programmed. We're not robots. We're not angels. <laughs> we're far from it. Amen. We're flesh. Stinky and rotten to the core. We're flesh. We need Jesus. Far more than a bath and a shower can fix. We need a cleansing. Down deep in our soul. My God. Amen. He gave us the ability to choose. That's why I will rejoice. I will sing. I will celebrate. Amen. I will be happy. I mean, oh, that's a choice. That's a choice. I'm going to make up my mind. Oh, I'm tired in my body, but I'm still going to have a good day. Amen. My throat's sore, but I'm still going to praise the Lord. Come on. I'm gonna, I choose. I choose to praise him because he's Lord. He's Lord. He's large and in charge. Oh, praise God. 
He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the, I mean, know that song. He's got the whole wide world in his hands. And then he goes on. He's got the tiny little baby in his hands. But the world doesn't like babies no more. But he's got that tiny little baby in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. Come on, someone clap your hands and say, that's the God I serve. That's the God I serve. He's the master of it all. He's the creator of all things. Oh, my God. What man made a mountain? Oh, wait. What man made a sea? Come on. But I know a man who, who made the whole wide world. And his name is Jesus. You know what we do? We make problems. <laughs> we back up sewers. But he made the whole world flowing <laughs> with milk and honey. Praise God. He's got the ability, church. He's got the power in his hands. And his name shall be called Wonderful. Oh, isn't Jesus such a wonderful name? Yeah. Counselor. He will be the mighty God, the everlasting Father. Mary, that baby that's in your arms is the king of all. He didn't come with robes of purple. Hello? He didn't have a gold crown on his head. Now, he could have, and he'd have every right to, but he didn't. He came, and he humbled himself. My Lord, he didn't have a chariot heralding the way. He was born in a manger, side by side to donkeys and cows. I'm telling you, the humility of our God. We wouldn't even want that. We, we're looking for the nicest hotel to rest our head. We're looking for bed bugs. But Jesus was right amongst it all. <laughs> Mary, did you know that that baby is going to be the savior of the world? He's got power in his hands. His right arm spans the universe. Now, the, now the, this world right now is all freaking out over this coming eclipse. Don't you worry about it. Come on now. Don't you worry about it. The Bible says they can they look at the sky and they marvel and they're amazed by it, but they, can't, they don't even know what day it is. They don't even know the coming of the Lord. Now, we can appreciate God's handiwork. But we're not afraid. He didn't say look for a star. He said look for me. He didn't say look for an eclipse. He said look for me. Well, praise the Lord. Now we can stand in awe of God's handiwork. So go ahead, get you some eclipse glasses and enjoy what God. But don't you be afraid about nothing. He's got the whole world in his hands. And I serve the God who's got the whole world in his hands. If he can take care of the eclipse, he'll take care of you and me. He didn't die for the moon and the star. He died for you and me. Come on now. We're greater than the, than the sparrow. If he sees that sparrow fall, how much more you and me. Church, I'm just trying to let you know how awesome our God is this morning. He's a good God. Prophet Isaiah spoke of this babe growing to be a man and he would be crucified. This babe Jesus would grow and that he would suffer and he would be persecuted amongst his own people. Sounds like a bad family reunion, doesn't it? Someone say your neighbor, not much has changed. Families are still fighting. <laughs> Even Jesus, his own family rejected him. Well, Jesus' own family didn't want him. <laughs> they were despised and rejected him. That's right. We see in Isaiah 53, verse 3 to 5, it says he was despised and rejected of men. This is not yet the world. This is his own backyard. All of Israel, the scribes and the Pharisees, they, were, they hated Jesus. Who do you think you are, Jesus? Forgiving sin. How dare you call yourself God? Well, he could say it because he was. And they wanted to pick up stones and 
kill him. And they were just so angry with him. A man of sorrows acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. And he was despised. And we esteemed him not. His own people rejected him. Saints, if your own family is rejecting you for the gospel's sake, don't worry about it. If your families don't understand your love for Jesus, don't worry about it. Even Jesus was despised. They did not esteem him. You know what that word means? It, it means they did, not, they did not honor him. They did not respect him. They didn't pull out chairs for him. They did not esteem him. They didn't love him. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Isaiah did not see what he prophesied, but he was speaking to the future. That Jesus would carry the sins of the world. He carried our sorrows. Anybody have sorrows? He's going to carry it for you. Yet we esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Those are big words, but what they're telling is that our sins, he suffered for our sins. He suffered. He was wounded. For even the things that we've done wrong, he willingly is going to suffer so that we could have life. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. Someone right now just lift those hands and say, thank you, Jesus, for your healing touch on my body right now. Thank you, Jesus. Prophet Isaiah spoke of things to come. Jesus Christ, the anointed one, would one day suffer die for the whole world, the sins of the world. I'm not talking about the mountains and the streams. They're fine. I'm not talking about animals. They're fine. I'm talking about humanity, women and men who have turned their backs on God. Not much has changed from the very beginning as it was in the days of Noah, as it was in the times of the Tower of Babylon, as it was in the days of Lot, Sodom and Gomorrah, as it was in the days of Nineveh, we are experiencing that right now. The pride of man is gross in the nostrils of God. But yet he died for the whole world so that you and I would have a hope of eternal life. Oh, church, make up in your mind tonight. Make up your mind this afternoon. I'm going to serve the Lord. I'm going to make heaven my home. I don't want those nail-scarred hands to go to waste on my life. I'm going to serve the Lord. He bore my shame. He bore your sin so that we here today could lift our hands without shame and reservation. You know, the jubilation that we've experienced, not everybody has that. We can run and dance. Not everybody can do that. We can clap our hands and celebrate. Not everybody can do that. And I don't say that to brag, but I'm here to let you know I'm thankful to God yes. that we have an, a, the right to, to praise the Lord. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Who is willing to take the blame for someone else's mistake? Who's willing to do that? That's not our world. That's not our society. You're wrong, and you own that wrong. But Jesus, he took the sins of the world. He was willing to take the punishment of sin upon himself. There's no one, I, don't, I haven't met anyone who is willing to take the blame of somebody else. And yet, he took the sins of the world upon his life. We, tr we try to protect ourselves. We try to protect our reputation. And yet his love was so great. He said, I will take the sins of the world and I will carry them and I will accept the penalty of that sin upon my life. Church, you realize how blessed we are? What an honor. There's not a judge in this world 
that looks upon that thief on that auction block and says, you know what? I'll stand in your place today. I've not met a single judge. Have you? Not a single judge. There may be some mommies and daddies that want to do it, but listen, there is a Jesus. He said, I'll take not just yours, but the whole world. I know you deserve to die, but I'll stand in the gap between you and death, <laughs> between you and life. I'll bridge that gap. I'll stand in the gap for you. I'll take that sorrow so that you could live today. Jesus in his ministry touched many lives. That little babe grew and he became a man. And his mother said, Jesus, it is now time. Thank God for godly mothers. Jesus, it's now time. He said, oh, he said, woman, it's not yet my time. She said, yes, it is. Go into that wedding and you help them out. Turn that water into wine. Give him a little boost. Said, Go ahead in there. And he started his ministry. He realized that this wedding feast had run out of wine, and so he said, fill those jars with water. And as they poured out, God did a miracle. He turned that water into wine, and they said, boy, you've saved the best for the last. You know why they do that? Because they saved the best for the beginning. And once they're so intoxicated, they don't even know what they're drinking at the end. They're drinking sewer water at the end. They don't care. And they said, wow, you saved the best for the last. Oh, when God gets a hold of something, the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. And we can see in the ministry of Jesus, he touched lives. He called 12 apostles. Now, they tell us that these were young men. We, know, we imagine them as 30, 40-year-olds. But Jesus himself was starting at 30. Thir you know, there's a reason for that because you go in the Old Testament, and you couldn't serve in the, in the tabernacle until you were 30. Because men, you know why? You got over yourself. You're done playing the fool. I'm being serious. Between 18 and 29, Men are in trouble. Ooh. But by the time they get to 30, they've settled down. And they're going to be able to serve in the sacred places. <laughs> Y'all looking at me funny. I will. Jesus started ministering at 30. Good example. Called these young men. I'm going to make something different out of your life. Open blinded eyes, cast out devils, heal the sick, deliver the demonic, set the captive free. But when he came to the age of 33 and a half years old, he faced Calvary. My God. Imagine, 33 and a half years old. 30, what, what, what were you doing at 33 and a half years? Right? And here, Jesus. 33 and a half years old, he's ready to die for the whole world. The cross was just in front of him. You know, the cross today has been glamorized. Roman Catholicism has made the cross uh, a, a symbol of, of uh, something to idolize. They put it on the wall, and I know some people do it with sincerity. I understand that. But in, that, in those days, in ancient Israel days, in the times of Rome, when Rome took over Israel, the cross was reserved for the worst of criminals. It is like the modern electric chair, the death sentence, reserved for the worst of criminals. And the cross was just ahead. And the most humiliating way to die was just down the road at 33 and a half years old. What was to lie ahead was the most horrific account of men's, man's suffering. Luke 22 and verse 42 says, this is the word to Jesus. He said, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. 
What cup is this? He's not talking about a bottle of water or you know, glass of Coca-Cola. He, he's talking about Calvary. Because he knew that what was lying ahead would be the worst account of human suffering. This cup of gall, bitterness, this cup of wrath and death, horrible, horrific, is just hours ahead. He was in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he needed some friends to help him pray. Yet his friends were sleeping. Anybody been there before? You need a friend to help you, and there's no friend to be found. Can I encourage you, saints? It's good to have friends in church, but you've got to get your own walk with God. Pastor's here to help you, but there's sometimes I can't pick up the phone every time you call. you got to have your own altar. you got to have your own experience. We're here for you. We love you. But there's a time where you got to have your own prayer meeting. Can you not tarry with me for an hour? And they said, oh, oh, yes, Jesus. This reminds me of Tuesday night prayer meeting. Yes, yes, Pastor. Just <laughs> it's just human nature. And we're fighting our flesh to stay awake. We're fighting our flesh. Even this morning, I said, Jesus rose from the dead, and he helped me raise from my bed. But I'm in the house today. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Don't look at me strange. <laughs> That's right. He helped us. Because we're flesh. Some of you want me to act so dignified. and uh, You know what? It's when we can share the truth. The truth will set us free. The truth will set us free. It helps us. Even Jesus was in that garden. He said, oh, Father, if you be willing. He didn't put up a facade. I got this in the bag. This is nothing. Calvary, uh, water off a duck's back. No, no, no. He said, if it's possible, could this be removed? You know what that was? That was Jesus in the flesh. He knew because he grew up in that culture. He knows cross is horrific. The cries of those criminals is echoed across the valley. And I'm next to go on that Calvary's cross. He was being honest. Church, we got to be honest with God. When you pray, don't act like you got it all together. Tell him all about it. Lord, I'm a mess. But you're the mess cleaner upper. Only you can do this. Without you, I'm a mess. Well, praise the Lord. And the scribes and the Pharisees who were Israel's high, lofty elite, they knew the laws of Moses, and they were so full of pride. And Jesus rebuked them and said, you are hypocrites. You're like sepulchers. That's a coffin, by the way. And uh, you're pretty on the outside, but inside you're dead man's bones. And they were so angry with Jesus. And they said, we want to crucify him. And they brought him before Pilate, the governor, the representative. And, and, and Pilate couldn't understand. Brother Jesse, can you come help me? This is Pilate. Just imagine that you're the people of Israel and you're just, crucify him. And Pilate said, you know, I don't get it. What has he done? What, wh why has he made you so mad? What, what's, the, what's the crime? Did he steal? Did he, you know, what did he do? What's the matter with you, Israelites? And this is what Pilate did. He washed his hands. He said, the death is not on me. It's on you. And you know what the people of Israel said? They said, let the blood of Jesus be upon our children's children. They accepted that curse, the responsibility of the death of the Savior, not just upon them, but upon their children's children. Can I tell somebody, we pray for Israel, and that's it. 
God will take care of her. You don't have to defend Israel. Just pray for her. That's it. Reach everybody. Reach all of God's children. Can I just leave that with you? Pilate said, I don't know what's your problem. And he washed his hands. Thank you, Brother Jesse. Amen. He said, if you kill this man, it's not on me. My hands are clean. In Matthew 27 and verse 23, the governor said, why? What evil hath he done? But they cried out the more, saying, let him be crucified. It was like a, 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 an insanity came upon the people. You know, when people get so angry, they, uh, when, you're, they, when you're angry, men, be careful. We become, we become fools. And that's what happened to Israel. They, they just became so enraged. Crucify him. Pilate couldn't understand. And they answered in verse 25, his blood be upon us and our children. But can I tell you something? We as apostolics, children of the Lord, we are not going to accept the curses of this world upon our families. We're praying for our children. We're praying that they do well in school. We pray that they succeed. We pray that they thrive. Oh, pastor, they're not living for God. That's all right. We're covering them with prayer. We're believing God's going to save them. God's going to help them. God's going to deliver them. Look at those 33 children. Look at what God is doing. All across Alberta, Saskatchewan. You know, we had people drive 20 hours to be at that conference. Nine hours, 10 hours, five hours, seven hours. We were there to have church. And we came with a hunger. Oh, yes. I refuse to accept the curses of the world upon my children. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. The cycle ends here. The curse of sin ends in my family. Hallelujah. Well, pastor, you don't know what's happening. That's all right. You just keep living for God. And you watch God turn that whole situation around. You just be faithful. You just keep praying. As long as there's breath, there's hope. As long as there's breath, there's hope. Hallelujah woman came to Jesus and said, Jesus, my daughter's full of devils. And he said, it's not good for me to give you the bread. Children of Israel have not yet eaten. I remember that message. He said, yeah, Lord, but I, I'll accept the crumbs. He said, go, your daughter's healed. Come home now. How many believe that for your children? They're wrestling with devils. They're wrestling with demonic spirits. They're wrestling with suicide. They're wrestling with all kinds of things, but you just keep holding fast, Mom. You just keep holding fast, Dad. It's going to turn around. Oh, yes, God's going to help. God's going to deliver. God's going to set them free. Somebody clap your hands and believe for it. Based on both biblical and historical evidence, it is safe to say that Jesus may have suffered more physical pain in his final hours on earth than any man in history. Jesus Christ knew ahead of the what was coming. He knew ahead. You know, I find that so amazing. If, if, if you know what's coming down the road, you would do your very best to avoid it, wouldn't you? And yet Jesus who's God, who knows all things, who do you think inspired Isaiah to, wrote, to write the Holy Scriptures? It was God. Of course Jesus knew what was coming down. <laughs> he knew it all. He knew every detail. Right from the beginning, he knew that he was going to suffer before it even happened. And this caused him great distress in the Garden of Gethsemane. The Bible says that before he was arrested, his sweat became drops of blood falling upon the ground. Now, the scientific terminology, and I hope I get this right, is called hematidrosis. And this occurs when somebody is under great stress. You know when you've been under great and, and, and you're afraid to get blood vessels burst? Anybody been there? Experienced that? Very similar. 
under, the, the stress that Jesus was under, the distress where the sweat glands burst and blood is mixed with sweat pours out of the pores. So instead of salt body water, blood is literally coming out of the forehead of Jesus. We can't even fathom. We've, we, we've, been in, uh, we've had ugly crime moments where your face is beat red and you're holding your stomach. But Jesus is in the garden. And instead of sweat pouring out of his forehead, blood is coming out of his pores because of the stress the distress that his body was in. He was praying. In the beginnings of all these sufferings, right after he was betrayed and arrested and deserted by his disciples, his own disciples deserted, betrayed him for 30 pieces of silver. He said, the one that I kiss, Judas said, the one that I kiss is, is Jesus. And Judas comes up to Jesus and Gives him a kiss. Be careful of those who kiss you. Ooh. Come on now. Be careful. He came up and gave Jesus a kiss, and soldiers came and arrested him. Judas, you betrayed me. Where's all his friends now? Disciples, can you take a picture, brother? Great betrayal. He was taken to the high priest's house he was struck in the face by an officer of the high priest. Afterwards, he was blindfolded and beaten, and they spit in his face. They had plucked out his beard. They pulled on the hairs on his face. It's not like the beards today where it's all manicured and well-groomed. This was a natural beard. They could get fistfuls, and they could pull on his beard and the excruciating pain. And as they're pulling out his beard, they're mocking him. You say you're king of the Jews. And he did not once retaliate. He did not once fight back. And before being led to the crucifixion site, Pilate, Pilate ordered Jesus to be flogged. And this was a Roman method of torture. They would have stripped Jesus of his clothing. The shame of it all to be revealed and to be exposed. And they tied him to a post and they would put his hands above his head so that his skin would be tight. And this would cause the whipping to be more excruciating. They call it the cat or nine tails where they would flog an individual. History reveals that this would be an 18 inch long handle with nine leather straps about six to seven feet long. On the ends of these straps would be small pieces of animal bone, rock, or metal. And they would whip the back of Jesus. And after each successful lashing, those edges would catch the skin of the back of Jesus. And it would literally rip his body. According to ancient history, in the book of Deuteronomy, it was a law that they could not succeed 40 lashes because the pain and the torture would literally kill a person. Historians tell us that it's very possible that the back of Jesus was so raw that it could resemble hamburger. They have said that people's backs, their spines could even be exposed. It is something beyond we could ever imagine. It was an inhumane way. After they stripped his back, and his back was beyond recognition. They crushed a crown of thorns into his head. They suggest that these thorns are about two, two inches long. And we know that the head is such a sensitive place that with all of these piercings in his head, that blood would gush down his forehead, down his back. Not once did he retaliate. Not once did Jesus resist. It's good, church, for us to see what he went through for us. It's good that we slow down 
and we go through and itemize his suffering. I, don't, I know we don't like it, but it's necessary. It makes us think twice when we want to be foolish. It makes us think twice when we want to throw in the towel and say, oh, this is too rough. What about Jesus? What about what he suffered? When we don't get our way and we don't get our jelly beans and we get upset with God, what about what he suffered? I said, oh, God, help me to never throw in the towel. Help me to never look back. Come on, young people. Come on, saints of God. We're not going to give up now. All that he went through. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And after such a flogging, this victim would be forced to carry their cross to the crucifixion site. I cannot imagine the pain as he carried that rough piece of wood on his back and his back being so exposed. The rubbing, the irritation, the slivers, they just, it's just unimaginable. And according to the Bible, Jesus was so weakened from his beating that he could not carry the cross all the way. A man by the name of Simon the Cyrene helped Jesus carry his cross. You know, Jesus could have tapped into his divinity and carried it all the way. But not once did he do that. He willingly endured that suffering. There's a passage of scripture that I want to show you that it literally shocked me. I don't know where I've been all these years, but this scripture just jumped out at me, and I want to show you something. Matthew 27, verse 48 says, And straightway one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink. Forgive me for the crudeness, but a sponge in the days of Rome was their toilet paper. They took a stick with a sponge and put vinegar and they forced it into the mouth of Jesus. Now, no, it was not the feces of his people, but it was the feces of Roman in his mouth. You do the research. And yet not one time did he resist. I can't imagine. I want you to right now look and see what other God would do this for his creation. I know not men, but Jesus, the Savior of the world. He didn't spit it out, but he submitted to the suffering. They dragged him, brought him to Golgotha, the place of the skull. It was a place just off of Jerusalem known as the place to die. And there they nailed him to the cross. And they tell us that the hand in Greek is actually representing the wrist. You could not nail in the hand and it support the, the weight. Now there's debate about that, but I just submit to you that they nailed him to the cross. And the weight of his body to hold him up. They nailed his feet. And the strategic location. Now this to me, I've never recognized this before, but the reason for it is that it would hit the nerves within his hands. And there would be minimum blood loss but maximum pain. And it would be like experiencing a continuous shock with no release. Are you with me here today? And every time that Jesus would try to breathe, the body would go into shock again and again and again. It was a slow way to die. It was a tormenting way to die. And it was meant to be a slow agonizing way. They say that it takes victims sometimes hours, days, and some even a week 
before they're completely dead on that cross. It just gives us an insight to the suffering, of how badly Jesus suffered for us. During this time, they would experience excruciating pain. We get the word excruciating from the Latin excruciatious, meaning to crucify. That's where that word comes from. We say excruciating, not realizing that Jesus lived it on the crucifixion. And at the end of his life, he shouted, it is finished. Just those words to get enough strength, just enough breath, but to put his body into shock. John 19, 30, when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. He tasted the sins of the world. He said, it is enough. It is done. And he bowed his head. And he gave up the ghost. Right there. There is Jesus, our Savior. The enemy is laughing. The Israelites are laughing. Rome is laughing. Satan is laughing. But oh, they don't realize that that's Jesus, our Savior. The God of all who's created all things. He's not going to stay there on the cross. He's got all power in his hand. The devil thought he won. Can I tell somebody, I don't care how many times you fall, you get back up. Don't you let what he did on Calvary be in vain. I don't care how many times you fail. Get back up. Don't let the devil laugh. Don't let the devil have the final say. Don't let the devil laugh, aha, aha, in your face. But you tell him, devil, I'm going to win. I've got victory. Jesus Christ has died for me, and I'm going to win. You know what? This tells us that the devil doesn't know everything. Some of us, we've made the devil almost as strong as God. And he's not. He didn't know Jesus' next move. He thought, boy, I'm going to win. <laughs> He doesn't know. Three days later. <laughs> Matthew 28, verse 1. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and other Mary to see the sepulcher. They come to see the place where the Lord lay. The Bible says he was in a borrowed tomb. He wasn't meant to last forever. Hallelujah. He was not meant to be buried forever. But yet, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Jesus, they don't know yet. And they're like, we got to go see the body of Jesus. And they come, and behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven, came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. And his countenance was like lightning, and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angels answered and said unto the woman, Fear not ye. I mean, just three days prior, he just witnessed the most horrific thing to known to, to humankind. He said, Fear not. Oh, saints, fear not. Oh, it may be dark, but don't be afraid. God's got the answer. Someone shout, God's got the answer. For I know that you seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here. He's not there. He's not here. For he is risen, as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay. Oh, you know what? The Lord was speaking to me about this. He said, there's no bones in that grave. Amen. All of us, if the Lord should tarry, Amen. We'll see death. And we'll have a plot of land somewhere where our bones will lay. That's just normal. The body tissues break down. The skin breaks down. Your nose and ears will disappear. But your bones remain. They can tell just by your bones if you're a man or a woman. How many know that? It don't matter. By that time, your brain's already disappeared. They can't ask you what you thought you were. They'll know what you are by your bones. 
That's just science. Come on now. They can tell by your DNA, by the marrow of your bones. And they say bones are made of hard material called collagen, covered in a layer of mineral salts. Very, very, very slow to decay. All of us, by if the Lord should tell you, we'll all have bones in the earth. We all have skeletons. But there's only one that does not have a skeleton. That's Jesus Christ. <laughs> Jesus. You know how they say all of us have skeletons in the closet? Ever heard that expression? We all have secrets. All have a past. There's only one that has no past. Only one that has no skeleton to find. Now hang on a minute. Listen to this. But you know what covers the multitude of sins? His blood. His mercy covers all of our past. Covers our sins. Covers our mistakes. Come on, somebody. Covers our past. And you go and look and they say, we found the bones of Jesus. They say, you did not. They're lying. They want so bad for this to be a falsehood. But you cannot. It's written in the word of the Lord. Not only was it written in the word, but Israel knew it. Not only Israel, but Rome knew it. It's in their own history book. It's not just religion. It's a historical fact that Jesus rose from the dead. Hallelujah. Come see the place. <laughs> Where the Lord lay. He's not here. You can look around. There's no bones here. There's no body here. Well, they thought, well, maybe someone stole the body. See, that's how man thinks. That's how people think. But there is a greater power, church. Greater power. When we die to sin in repentance. That's what our children did on the weekend. They said, Jesus, I'm sorry of all the sins I've ever committed. Amen. You're only six years old. What could you have done? But nonetheless, they said, God, forgive me. And God instantly forgave those children. And they surrendered. And God filled them with the precious gift of the Holy Ghost. Jesus is our example. He died to self and he willingly went into that tomb but oh church we're not going to stay dead like Christ we shall rise like Christ we will have newness of life on the third day he rose from the grave oh when you come out of that watery grave and you begin to speak with tongues and the spirit of God comes upon you oh somebody shout hallelujah Woo. That's what Jesus did. He gave us the example. You got to die to your sins. You got to say sorry. You got to turn away. You can't live like the devil and expect to get the Holy Ghost. You got to turn away from your sins. I said, Lord, I'm done with sin. I don't want to live like this anymore. Forgive me of all I've ever done. The Bible says a broken and a contrite heart he will not despise. Y'all heard me just a moment ago. We all have skeletons, but repentance is the only thing that will give you a new life. Amen. Nicodemus said, how can I crawl into my mother's womb and be born again? John 3 says that you look it up in your Bible. Jesus said, no, 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 I'm not talking about a natural birth. I'm talking about a spiritual birth. I'm talking about getting a new identity. The world says I was born this way, but Jesus said you're going to be born again. Marvel not that I say unto thee, you must be born again. Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Jesus. New life, new identity. Anybody got a new life? Anybody got a new identity? Your friends may not understand it. Your neighbors may not understand it. But you tell them, if only you knew me before I met Jesus. But now I'm a new creature. He's taken me. He changed me. And he's rearranged my life. Oh, somebody shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus gives us that example. He willingly died. 
buried him like we must be buried in baptism. Wash. See, what dead person lays on the surface? A neglected person, that's who. Loved ones, bury them six feet down. You don't put sand of salt on top and call it a day. You, put, you dig deep six feet down in the ground. Is that right? You got to be buried in Jesus' name. Jesus came out of that grave with all power in his hands. When you come out of that water, God can give you the precious gift of the Holy Ghost. He's the example for us to follow. It is he. Amen. Graveyards are full of bones. Animal bones are all over the countryside. But Jesus' bones are nowhere to be found. He rose from that grave. Come on, somebody. Paul writes... In Romans 6 and verse 9 says, look at this now, knowing that Christ, now this is Paul writing to the Roman church. This is after the fact. This is years later. He said, see, these are witnesses, church. This is the first century apostolics. He said, knowing that, he said, you know that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. One time is all it takes. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise reckon ye also yourself to be dead indeed unto sin. He's saying, church, we got to die to the flesh. How many know the flesh is dangerous? You leave it alone, you're in trouble. You got to die to your flesh, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, your natural body. Don't let sin take control of you. You know what worship means? Worship is when you can tell your body no. Your body wants to do stuff. Your mind wants to do stuff. Your voice wants to say stuff, but you say no. That's worship. It's not just all about hallelujah and running around and breaking out in a sweat. But it's even in our private times. It's even when no one is looking and no one is around and you can tell your body, no. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that ye should obey it in the lusts thereof. Neither yield ye your members as an instrument of unrighteousness unto, your, unto sin, but yield yourself unto God. Oh, don't yield yourself to temptation, but yield yourself to God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. You know what he's saying? Use your hands for good things. Use your feet to glorify God. Use your mind to glorify God. Before Christ, this mind was in trouble. Before Christ, these hands did things they should have never done. Come on now. These feet went places I should have never gone. But oh, now that I'm alive, my hands, my mind, my voice, my feet, oh, they're doing a new dance. I used to dance for the devil, but now I'm dancing for Jesus. Oh, I used to do things I am ashamed of, but now I'm working Working, working for the Lord. Come on, somebody. I'm alive. I'm alive. My life is in the hands of Jesus. For sin shall not have dominion over you. For ye are not under the law, but under grace. Woo. You hear what the preacher saying? Without Jesus, sin has control over you. How many know what I'm talking about? Without Jesus, sin has control over you. Turn me down, brother. Without Jesus, we're in trouble. Oh, yes. But now, we're not under the law. Somebody shout hallelujah. We're not under the law, but we're now under grace. Let's all stand together. My God, what a blessed hope. Musicians, would you come? My God.
Anybody thankful for the goodness of the Lord? My God, let's just lift our voices right now. Thank you, Jesus. Today is Resurrection Sunday. Don't let this, don't let this opportunity pass you by today. As we remember the suffering of his body, he said, remember me. That's why we have Holy Communion. We remember the breaking. That's why I tell the saints, literally rip that bread. Rip that bread. And you remember the ripping of his flesh. Drink of that cup. We remember his blood. It pierced his side. Blood and water came out. Oh, church. But we're not, we're not a slave to sin anymore. Thank you, Jesus. Now, I don't want the service to end with weeping and crying. You heard Brother Brown? He said, in the north? I said, my Lord, this preacher is on fire. Yeah. What did he say about the north? We're prone to what? Depression. I said, he's been in my messages. He's been in our services. Because he knows. He lives in the north too. Church, we're not going to be weeping all the time. We've got a reason to rejoice. We've got a reason to celebrate. We've got a reason to clap our hands. Hallelujah. I believe God. I believe God. Hallelujah. I believe in him and his power and his resurrection. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, let's celebrate him right now. He's a good God. Hallelujah. I want you to join with a neighbor beside you and tell them God's been good to me. Give them a testimony and tell them what God has done for you. we got transition. Amen. God's been faithful. God's been merciful. God has brought me out of darkness. God has rescued me. God has forgiven me. Let's move quickly, musicians. We thank God for helping us. We thank God for being merciful. I believe him. And we trust in him. I want somebody right now to rejoice together. Oh, he promised me.
to baptism. We thank God that He is alive. Amen. And our children receive the Holy Ghost and they will experience the plan of salvation. Praise the Lord. Amen. So as the baptistry is getting ready and our uh, brother Trevor is getting ready to be baptized in Jesus' name. My, 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 my. Look what the Lord has done. He healed our bodies. He touched our mind and he saved us just in time. Song says, I'm going to praise his name. Yeah. Amen. You think, well, what can a seven-year-old do? I'll tell you what I can remember. Six years old, filled with the Holy Ghost. And I went down into the water and I came out. I said, I felt so clean, clean. He said, well, what kind of sins have you done? Well, enough to know that I needed to be forgiven. I said, Trevor. Why do we got to be baptized without missing a beat? To wash our sins away. Yes. That you're ready, son. You're ready. Thank you, Jesus. We got to have our sins washed away. Praise the Lord. And as we're waiting for the baptistry, praise the Lord. I want somebody to testify. Sister Lovell, leave your testimony in Jesus' name. Praise him. You may be seated, church. Amen. Tell it all. Thank you. 
Yes. Praise the Lord. We thank God for that testimony. Amen. Amen. I want Brother Ryder to leave his testimony. Brother Ryder, tell the church how good you kind of trip you had. I got what you tell, and I'm just thankful for that. Amen. He said, I got refilled. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Isn't that awesome, church? Look what God is doing. I, this is just beautiful. Amen. We can all witness this baptism. Sister Desiree, I want you to testify. Lift up Jesus. Tell the church what God is doing. Praise God. What a beautiful testimony. Beautiful testimony. Sister Priscilla, testify. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Glory to God. Praise the Lord, church. If you can hear me, stomp your feet. Praise God. We are so excited to be baptizing Brother Trevor in the wonderful name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. We're going to move quickly in Jesus' name. We're going to pray for Brother Trevor right now in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in his life. We thank you, Lord, that you filled him with the Holy Ghost. We thank you, God, for your love upon our children. I pray right now, God, for your goodness upon all the lives of our children, Lord. As we continue, Lord, to give you our lives and our hearts and our souls. From this day forward, God, we are believing that you're going to help, Lord, and you're going to use them for your glory. In Jesus' name. Thank you. 
Jesus, we're so thankful for your mighty power that has moved throughout this place today. We're so thankful for the touch of your presence upon each and every one that is here under your roof, O oh God, and those who are under the sound of my voice, those who are watching at home. We're thankful for your goodness and your mercies, your wonderful power that has helped us and strengthened us here this morning. Thank you for what we get to take with us from this place. Thank you for the witness and the testimony that we get to bring with ourselves into our job places, into our schools, oh God, into our families in the coming week. We thank you, Father, for your mighty power that continues to work through your children. And thank you for the wonderful blessings and miracles that you have given into our lives and for what is continuing to happen here in Athabasca. We thank you, God, for your mighty goodness and your power. We thank you for your love and your mercy. Help us to go in your love and to share your goodness with those in this week to come. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you, Lord, for your wonderful power and your goodness. We close our service by reading in Numbers chapter 6, verse 24 to 26. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. May the Lord bless you. You are dismissed at this time. Have a wonderful week. Blessed in the love of the Lord.